So thank you for coming to another in our continuing programming commemorating the 200th anniversary of the birth of Charles Dickens. Today's, tonight's program is the kickoff to our Charles Dickens in film. Tonight's speaker, our guest speaker, we're very honored to have Corey Creekmer, who is associate professor in the University of Iowa Departments of English, Cinema, English and Cinema and Comparative Literature. So I will turn it over to Corey. If you don't have a list of the upcoming films, there is a list somewhere. I will find it for you. And they will begin on the 16th and end on Friday, April 6th. And then sometime in December, we haven't quite decided when, we're going to do a marathon of the Christmas Carol in all of its iterations, as many as we can get. So look forward to that. We'll be announcing that. And then there'll be other things throughout the, the year about Charles Dickens. So, Corey? Um, in doing a little bit of research for this, uh, I'll, I'll warn you, you may not want to do all the Christmas carols you can find. There are lots of them. Um, um, it's, uh, it's probably, it's kind of a, a, a neck and neck race um, with what there are more versions of uh, between Oliver Twist and Christmas Carol. Those are clearly the two that have been adapted the most. Um, I thought actually what I would do is uh, to get started, show you a clip, and I may come back to a couple of other clips um, during my presentation, which is meant to be a very um, general kind of overview to the, the history of, of adaptations in the film of Dickens, of which there have been hundreds and hundreds. Um, it's commonly thought that he's probably the most adapted author um, except for uh, his countryman Shakespeare. Um, probably more Shakespeare films, but uh, if you if you want to get picky and say, well, Shakespeare wrote plays and Dickens wrote novels, Dickens is, is almost certainly the most adapted novelist. Um, but I thought one way to convey that is to show you this very nice clip that the British Film Institute in London um, is participating, you know, as people are around the world, but for him, you know, this is a native son. Uh, they're participating by uh, staging a number of uh, major events around film and Dickens. They've restored some uh, prints of films and they're packaging them. And they've done a nice little sort of compilation. So let me, let me fiddle with this and show you that. This is again, just to sort of um, whet your appetite for what's to come in coming weeks. Devil, or I'll cut your throat. Please, sir. I want some more. What? Well, now, if uh, you're coming along, I better know who you are. My name's Oliver. Oliver Twist. Now, then, boys, the game will show Oliver how to make pocket handkerchief. better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. Your dealings, you have ever been the same cold-blooded fellow. <clears throat> do you intend undeceiving my husband tonight? It's not your secret. It's mine. Assure yourself, Mr. Clarence, that everybody concerned shall be nobly rewarded. Oh, you like to sleep with Sue? Or Ariel Howard? 
now stop, and vice versa, by applauding the malevolent machinations of our perilous enemies. In short, I have arrived. You will be visited by three spirits. What? Was that the chance of hope that you mentioned, Chick? It was. Oh, in that case, never mind. I think I'd rather not. Bob Cratchit, would you and your family care to join us for a little turkey dinner on this fine Christmas day? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas! Am I pretty? Yes, I think you're very pretty. Am I insulting? N no, not so much so as you were last time. Not so much so? No. There, take that, you cross little monster. What do you think of me now? Can you ever forgive me? Don't you know me at all? Yes, I like, I mean, this is, again, uh, if you're not familiar with the British Film Institute, they do, they do a kind of class act that's very nicely put together. Um, and again, I wanted to show it to you to give you a, um, a sense of the range of, of approaches to Dickens just encapsulated in, in that couple of minutes, um, and nicely uh, the continual uh, desire to adapt Dickens into cinema that now lasts over a century. Um, I like the, the mix of very recent examples there with some of the earliest surviving examples. Um, and what I wanted to do to kind of set up the, uh, that desire, why, why have we wanted to uh, continually see these stories from the 19th century retold and retold specifically in some of the clips that were television in, in the modern media of film and then television. Um, and so I want to I want to set up um, uh, the move toward that, but I want to go back a little bit. I want to go back a little toward Dickens' own time. Dickens, of course, d uh, dies before the arrival of cinema. He's close. He's, he's within something like 10 years of the arrival of cinema, but um, he doesn't survive into that period. Um, oops. Oh, sorry. I'm getting used to a computer that I'm not used to. There I go. Um, and one of the things I want to set in place is that, um, without question, Dickens is first and foremost a writer. He is, he is a man, he is a master of language. And so our first understanding of Dickens is in terms of the written word and prose and his, uh, as you all know from your own experience of reading Dickens, his elaborate uh, range within the, within the English language. Uh, so from the speech of characters at the lowest level of society to the highest. Um, but there's what I'm going to emphasize. So, so that I'm going to take as a given and you know, as, as many people have discussed and there's more to say about, but I'm going to emphasize another uh, concern that's there from the beginning, which is the attention to visualizing Dickens. Um, now, on the one hand, the prose offers this great um, entree into, you know, the visual imagination. Uh, Dickens is considered a master of description. Um, but this, this image, which is quite famous, um, is in fact incomplete. It's uh, an image that was prepared uh, at Dickens' death by one of his illustrators, 
and never actually completed. The illustrator himself died before he finished it. But it's become a, a, a much reproduced, much cited image because you have Dickens here in his chair surrounded by all of the characters he's, he's created. And this to me is nice in that it sums up again the visual impulse um, uh, in Dickens himself but then also in our reception of Dickens. We have wanted from the very beginning it seems to um, I mean this in the most you know, literal way, imagine, turn into images. We've wanted to imagine Dickens' world. We've wanted to imagine Dickens' characters. And this gives some sense of that, um, that impulse in Dickens himself. Um, this is a large topic on which many people, many scholars have, have worked diligently, and I'm just going to touch on it. But I think, as probably all of you know, Dickens, in fact, is imaged from the start. Almost all of his work is uh, published with illustrations, with a, a number of different illustrators, but a couple, uh, this is George Cruikshank, these are illustrations for Oliver Twist. Um, uh, on uh, the left, what is probably the most iconic image of uh, the novel Oliver Twist, Oliver asking for more uh, at, the, at the workhouse. Um, on the other side, you see um, the introduction of Oliver to uh, Fagin, uh, with the Artful Dodger making the introduction. Um, so initial readers of Dickens, for the most part, there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, every book was an illustrated book. Uh, so um, uh, they were illustrated when they were published serially, and then they were illustrated when they were published in books. So there was already this impulse, and I'm, I'm emphasizing this in part because it's common for people to say, and it's understandable, that uh, particularly about films, People say, well, often when there's a resistance to adaptations, people will say, I like to imagine it all myself. I don't like someone else doing the work for me of deciding what the character looks like. I like my own imagination to work in that. And that's an understandable um, pleasure we have in reading, that, that the reading and the description animates our own um, uh, imagination. But, for better or for worse, the publication of Dickens never entirely allowed that. Uh, Dickens, working very closely with his illustrators, was helping to define the visual look of, of his books and his characters right from the start. So the, the impulse, again, which will lead to making movies of Dickens' novels, the impulse to imagine what these characters or these, these places, these events look like, is there at the beginning of the experience of, of consuming Dickens' work. Um, Dickens was... Uh, part of a very rich um, pre-cinematic but um, still uh, overwhelmingly visual culture. Um, he did see the arrival of photography and I'm sure you've seen he himself was photographed a number of times. Um, but there, there are moments in some of the texts, and I've, I've picked two here, where you see his own recognition of uh, the shifting visual culture, particularly around uh, new technologies. Um, and the magic lantern was well in place by the time Dickens is writing uh, in the middle of the century. And so here are a couple of quotations from novels where he uses the magic lantern, which is commonly now seen as uh, a, a proto-cinematic or a pre-cinematic device leading toward uh, what will be the you know, full-scale projection of moving images. Lantern, uh, magic lantern shows uh, were in their way narrative. They weren't just um, random images. They were often marketed and sold, created in series. I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Um, but it's interesting that Dickens himself is using, for his own purposes and for his own metaphors, he's using this um, uh, technology, but that was also seen as, as a toy, seen as popular entertainment, a way to uh, amuse people through uh, reproductions of images. And so, um, it's intriguing that within his lifetime, and then especially after he dies, this visual culture that he's picking up on the novels picks up on Dickens. So here you've got, if you can read the box, uh, you've got this package set of, it's a Christmas Carol, you've got 12 slides complete with um, dialogue. I think what they mean is it probably came with a script uh, so that you could present these 12 slides summarizing the story of A Christmas Carol and you could narrate it. 
another way to do this would you could, you could actually read the story along with it, but that probably would take too long. And so already you've got this process of adaptation. The other thing people have trouble with adaptation about, um, you've got you know condensation. You've got cutting it down. You've got reducing it, uh, turning it into another medium. Uh, you're probably going to have to um, uh, cut and paste in some sense. And this ad, I tried to fit the whole thing in. Um, so I don't know how much of it you can see, but what you, if you can see, what's being advertised over here is this um, uh, etherscope. I'm not sure exactly that all these technologies had a, a whole range of different names, but something like a Magic Lantern show is being presented and they're presenting a Christmas Carol, which they present as a ghost story. So this is before cinema, but this is to say Dickens already is being located in a growing visual entertainment culture. And here are two slides from one of these sets. Um, you can see the numbers up there. And most of you are familiar with many, many versions of A Christmas Carol and probably can recognize where these occur in the story. So this is all before cinema arrives. Um, and other forms of visualizing Dickens, aside from cinema and television, begin early on and go up to this day. So, um, there's a huge range of, of sort of Dickens um, memorabilia, uh, Dickens kitsch, uh, Dickens objects, um, figurines, um, you know, dolls, all kinds of other things, and adaptation into Dickens uh, into other forms such as, if any of you remember these classics illustrated comics which were the sort of bane of high school teachers. Um, they were always, you know, fearing that students would read these instead of the, the actual novels to do their book reports. But Dickens made it into um, Classics Illustrated. Unsurprisingly, a number of Dickens stories are, are adapted in that form. So this is just a quick summary to say Dickens gets visualized in a wide range of ways, not just movies. Um, now, the question of adaptation. How did Dickens feel about adaptation? Well, we, we don't know how he might have felt about film adaptations. He didn't live to experience that. Um, but there's this passage from the novel Nicholas Nickleby. Now, this is, in the, this is the voice of a character. This is not Dickens himself, but um, this quotation might suggest some, some sense of how this author, um, who did understand himself primarily as a commercial author, he was unashamed of his status as a commercial author. Um, uh, this is a quotation in, in the novel in reference to um, someone who's been putting on theatrical adaptations, not in this case of Dickens, but if we extrapolate, this could be something like Dickens' attitude. I'll, I'll read this probably not as effectively as it des uh, deserves. You drag within the magic circle of your dullness subjects not at all adapted to the purposes of the stage. You take the uncompleted books of living authors, fresh from their hands, wet from the press, cut, hack, and carve them. Hastily and crudely vamp up ideas not yet worked out by the original project, their original projector. Do your utmost to anticipate his plot, all this without and against his will, to which you put your name as author. Now, show me the difference between such pilfering as this and picking a man's pocket in the street. This is perhaps not the most um, uh, encouraging words to someone who is thinking of adapting a work. Now, Dickens does seem to be, um, to get adapters off the hook, he does seem to be responding to what in fact was rampant uh, in his day, which was, uh, Dickens again, as I think you all know, was publishing serially. The books are coming out in, in pieces uh, before the collected uh, novel is put together, um, and it does seem that Dickens' novels were being adapted for the stage as they were appearing. And what he indicates here in this complaint is, and the people adapting them, not yet knowing how Dickens was going to end his novel, came up with endings. Um, what he's probably objecting to, this sounds like an artistic um, response, and it probably is, but it's probably also a commercial response. He's not getting paid for any of these. He's, they're being taken from him and nobody's, they're not putting his name on them and they're also not writing him a check. Um, the, the copyright laws that would have protected Dickens now did not exist then. So what these people are doing may be unethical, but it's not illegal. 
He doesn't have, at this point, legal recourse to this. All he can do is complain. Um, later, an impulse toward adapting the novels will be encouraged by, uh, by 1920, all of Dickens' novels are in the public domain. So one reason after 1920 that you might want to adapt Dickens, the reason you might want to now, is you don't have to pay a dime. Adapting Dickens, you pay no rights to anybody um, after 1920. So uh, there have been, the, you know, we understand what might be the artistic impulses toward adaptation, but there are also these commercial Im impulses and maybe even these ethical impulses or ethical questions how faithful should we be? How much can we change things? Um, you know, I don't like that sad ending. I think I'd rather have a happy ending. You know, how acceptable might that be? Um, but again, uh, it's our guess how Dickens might have responded to uh, the flood of film and TV adaptations that come after his life. Um, Dickens is adapted for cinema almost when cinema arrives. Um, film scholars like myself are very wary of, of ever saying anything is first. Every time we confidently claim a first, we always get undermined by research of someone you know, a year down the line. Um, it's likely, so I say with hesitation, with caution, I'd be happy to be proved wrong. It's the first Dickens adaptation is probably from 1897. Um, it doesn't survive, it seems. Many, many early films don't survive. Um, but this is a curious thing. This, uh, when I was uh, happily uh, asked to, to give this presentation, I thought, well, I'll do a little homework and see what's out there. And really, just the other day, this came on my radar, but um, it only came on the world's radar, I think, about a month ago that uh, the British, in preparing this, this ex exhibition that you saw the, the sort of advertisement for, um, they had found what they thought was the earliest surviving Dickens film and put this, this package of films together that's traveling throughout Great Britain. Um, and they found another one now. Uh, they found in their archives this film from 1901, um, which is uh, a few months earlier than what had previously been the first surviving film. The, the, the first surviving film was from late 1901. This is earlier in the year. So in this early period, we even count by months and weeks um, to gauge these things. So this is, again, this is not the first existing film, but it's now the first one we have. And I'm going to go ahead and show it to you. If I can again work my machine here properly. It's very short. Don't blink. <laughs> and there's no sound. Um, this is the film that, um, you can easily find the, that clip on YouTube. It's been posted by the British Film Institute. Actually, you can find it on their site as well. Um, and it's only, a, again, about a minute long. Uh, it may or may not be complete. That's hard to determine. This was thought to be the earliest surviving film, and this is, a, uh, as you'll easily guess, a version of Christmas Carol. I, I mentioned when some people were coming in, I think, that um, it, it it, it looks like it's almost a sort of neck and neck race between A Christmas Carol and uh, Oliver Twist, which Dickens' text has been adapted the most. Those two have both been adapted many, many, many times. 
Other, other texts have been adapted often, and there are occasionally some that have, have rarely been adapted for whatever reason. Um, but uh, probably the widest range of, of versions, and I'll come back to this, is Christmas Carol. Um, that, there's the appeal of the story itself, um, most obviously, but uh, that probably is in part attributable to a point I'll emphasize in a couple of seconds, uh, its length. Christmas Carol is a novella, and it uh, seems to work better. You can get more of it uh, in an adaptation to something that is, is either quite short, this film is only a few minutes long, or even a film that uh, is an hour if you're um, my age, you grew up where your Christmas Carol was the one starring Mr. Magoo. Um, uh, or, you know, maybe a 90-minute film. It fits very well into there, whereas, I'll, I'll, as I'll say in a second, there's a problem fitting into, say, 90 minutes or two hours, these 600, 800-page novels. Um, and so there's probably always been a, a, a popularity around Christmas Carol in addition to just the overwhelming popularity of the story it tells. Um, this is an interesting example, and you can find this on YouTube as well, uh, where an early filmmaker has recognized that the, um, the ghost story quality, the, the, the mystical qualities of the story, lend themselves well to the use of early special effects. So when early filmmakers, if, if any of you have seen um, the recent film Hugo, uh, that deals with uh, the French filmmaker Méliès, who is discovering all the magical tricks he can do with um, uh, the new motion picture camera. Filmmakers around the world are learning the, the ways in which you can manipulate motion picture cameras to create special effects, and so uh, a ghost story is an obvious place for that. Um, there are Shortly after this period, uh, from the early part of the century up to the end of the silent period in the late 20s, there are um, over a hundred adaptations in silent films just in the United States and Britain of Dickens films. There are also uh, uh, Dickens adaptations in France, in um, an unusual number in Norway, uh, around the world, there will be, particularly in Europe, though, uh, adaptations. And these are just samples from a couple of these. These are both um, American companies. Um, I think I've got one more. Oh, um, and one of the things that um, uh, is not quite in place yet in early cinema, but is coming uh, in this period into the first decade of the 20th century, is the adaptation of something that exists in the theater world to the film world, which is a star system. So one of the things early filmmakers are going to recognize is, I, I think a lot of the um, attraction to Dickens is the plots, but I think a larger attraction to filmmakers has been the characters. Um, there's always been a fascination, and this has something to do again back with visualization, the illustrations, the creation of figurines, dolls, things like that. Uh, this rich cast of characters that Dickens creates. And so one of the things that will, will get um, linked to early cinema is the featuring of key stars. Now this is a name probably not known to anyone now, but in fact was a quite well-known theatrical star of his day, Seymour Hicks. Um, who moved from, um, when it was still a bit daring to do this, uh, you know, cinema is a very lowbrow form, he moves from successful roles on stage to cinema. He already has a status, he's already known as um, uh, someone who has embodied Scrooge. And so when the filmmaker in 1913 wants to make a film about this story already, probably a dozen films have been made of this story already, he cast this actor. So part of the attraction will be, oh, I, I'm a fan of this, this performer, and I'm a fan of that character, and I would like to see them together. This continues, and I've given you probably a, a primary example of this, with uh, a, an actor like Alec Guinness, who across a very long career uh, plays in various Dickens adaptations. So this is uh, Alec Guinness in David Lean's adaptation of uh, Great Expectations, um, a quite controversial 
uh, role as Fagan, um, um, criticized by many people for its, its stereotypical representation of Fagan as a Jew in um, David Lean's Oliver Twist, and decades later um, uh, in Little Dorrit. So one of the things that has linked the history of performance, this is true on stage as well, but has linked the history of film stardom and film performance to Dickens is the pleasure we have in seeing a number of people move across Dickens' texts across their careers. This is probably even more true of character actors, um, less stars in some sense than uh, the many character actors. There's, there's a claim to be made, you know, that some of Dickens' main characters, the principal characters, are some of the duller characters. Uh, the sweet, bland, you know, figures that are sort of at the center of some of the stories, um, as opposed to the, the rich characters that surround them. And so it's, it's really the character actors where you have some people, if you've followed any of the BBC productions or things like that, you see these people who richly embody Dickens' characters across a long career. Um, another topic that's the particularly fascinating one for people like me who are coming at Dickens not as uh, a literary scholar, I'm not a Victorian scholar, I'm a, a film scholar, is the, the claim that has been made at least since um, uh, this, this essay was written in the 40s, but it's citing a much earlier period, uh, by prominent filmmakers. So this is a story uh, this is very well known within film studies, told by the Soviet um, filmmaker, very important um, in the history of film, particularly for his experiments with editing or montage, uh, Eisenstein, who wrote an essay in 1944 called Dickens, Griffith, and Film Today. And he recounts a story, he begins his essay by recounting this story from um, the American pioneer D.W. Griffith's wife at the time, who wrote a memoir. <laughs> about um, uh, Griffith, and she, she tells this little story that when Griffith was telling, um, making this film of, of Enoch Arden, which was a Tennyson poem, uh, about a, a, a couple who are separated, the man is um, stranded on a desert island for many years, Griffith comes up in 1908 with the idea of cutting between the wife at home and the man on the island. And the producers at his company, American Biograph, say, nobody will understand what's going on. You can't go from here to here just with one cut. Uh, it'll confuse people. And so um, the little dialogue here, you know, the producer, as it were, the boss says, how can you tell a story jumping around like that that people won't know what it's about? Griffin says, well, doesn't Dickens write that way? Yes, but that's Dickens. That's novel writing. That's different. Griffin's rejoinder, not so much. These are picture stories, not so different. There's, there's a sense, and it can only be retroactive, of course, but that Dickens was a very cinematic writer. That Dickens, particularly in the way he um, moved through his plots and, and the multiple strands of his plots, so that it's hard for us not to use cinematic terms now, the way he cuts, he wouldn't have had that term, but the way he cuts between characters or cuts between scenes, the way he uses a word like meanwhile or at that moment, a phrase like, you know, across town. Um, and it's clear that filmmakers like Griffith, uh, trying to figure out a kind of syntax or a language for early cinema, are on the one hand seen as pioneering this new medium, but at the same time they're going back to their models. And so someone like Dick, uh, Griffith is thinking, well, I read Dickens, and Dickens kind of hopped around, so why can't I? Uh, this claim that everyone will be lost, well, they're not when they read Dickens, so maybe I can model myself on that. Um, this is even more remarkable in a way that this story of Griffith, who is in his way a very conservative, um, He's, a, he's, a, he's an innovator in cinema, but in terms of his background in politics, notoriously conservative. Um, and then this story is being told with a certain amount of approval by uh, Eisenstein, who represents um, a highly political communist uh, adaptation of filmmaking. So both of them in, in their way citing um, Dickens as a significant precursor. Um, Dickens becomes crucial, adaptations are continuing apace, 
as cinema grows, and he becomes crucial in the development of the feature-length film. I said before, you know, these are long stories, and so uh, there's, there's a certain case to be made. There are different reasons why films grew longer, but um, it's clear that if Dickens was an attractive source, you want to make novel, uh, films from D Dickens' novels, you probably need more than five minutes or 20 minutes or even an hour. And so as long as Dickens is a regular source for films, and he is, uh, it seems that there's a certain motivation there for films to, to grow to greater and greater length. This will become a motive later for um, things like the TV miniseries. Uh, when the BBC has, has done adaptations uh, of Dickens, they've decided they actually need, you know, they're still probably short in terms of really getting the whole novels in, but they've decided, well, we actually need six hours, or maybe we need eight hours. There's a well-known film, you saw a clip from it, adaptation of Little Dorrit that is, um, I think it's six hours. Uh, it's actually done as two parts, uh, two three-hour films. Um, and this was set in place by, not a film version, but by the Royal Shakespeare Company, which um, I think was in the 80s, put on a, a staging of Nicholas Nickleby that was eight hours. Um, this is some attempt to match you know, the length of a film or a play adaptation to the length necessary to tell these long multi-plot novels. This is uh, an adaptation of uh, Oliver Twist starring uh, the child star Jackie Coogan, who had been discovered by Charlie Chaplin. And this is, you can't quite see him very well, but this is Lon Chaney, um, the, ma uh, the, the man of a thousand faces. Lon Chaney known for his um, masterful use of um, makeup, playing Fagin. So again, you've got stars uh, embodying these roles. Um, uh, this is an early film version of Little Dorrit, but uh, I also put over here, one of Chaplin, Chaplin goes from making uh, dozens of short films toward the ambition of, of getting longer and longer toward features. And one of his first moves in that direction is this film, The Kid, which is where he discovers the little boy, Jackie Coogan, who plays Oliver Twist right after this. He becomes a star. He plays Oliver Twist. But um, it's been pointed out before, it's not my insight at all, that this film is in its own way a kind of Dickens adaptation. It's not, literally, but in it you get something like little Jackie playing Oliver Twist and Charlie playing some combination of Fagin and the Artful Dodger. He does teach him how to do some naughty things. Um, and you, as you can see, they're hiding from the police, not very successfully here. Um, Chaplin is a figure whose own biography is often described as, as Dickens, Dickensian. Um, he, he came out of dire poverty. Uh, he was more or less raised by his, his older brother. His mother was um, uh, uh, in an asylum for much of his childhood. His father had abandoned the family. Um, so you do get, even though it's a later generation, you get a Londoner who grows up pretty much with something like um, uh, the scenario we're familiar with from some of Dickens' novels. Um, Dickens goes to Hollywood, of course. When Hollywood starts to make adaptations of Dickens' novels, and you'll see one in this series, um, uh, the, the version of um, David Copperfield with W.C. Fields. Uh, this is one of the other well-known Hollywood adaptations. By this point, this is the 1930s, Dickens brings a certain cachet to Hollywood filmmakers. Um, Dickens is a popular novelist, but by this point, Dickens is a revered classic. And so Hollywood will, when it, when it wants to make a Dickens adaptation, these are big budget films, casts of thousands, uh, spectacle, uh, you know, uh, big stars, uh, costumes, lavish sets. So Hollywood sees Dickens as, as a marker of a certain status. Um, you don't just make any old adaptation out of Dickens, you make it one of your big, splashy films. And this proved to be one. Um, so I just thought I would um, say something about um, uh, some of the, the four films that will be in this series that I hope all of you will take advantage of, of coming to see. And 
I helped with the selection of them and I wanted to give you some sense of what the selection process was. It was maddening, you know, there's so many and it would be great to see them all, but um, I, I decided in part by a couple of principles. I thought you should see one of these Hollywood examples. Um, and this is probably with Tale of Two Cities, the, the best known of them, um, this adaptation of David Copperfield. Again, a, in, the, in the period it was made, a big, expensive, lavish production um, directed by a well-known director, George Cukor, but um, adjusted for Hollywood by featuring a major, at this point, major Hollywood star. So part of the appeal of this film, actually a number of stars, but part of the appeal of this film is seeing the persona of W.C. Fields, who, like a lot of stars, this is one way we often distinguish between movie stars and actors. Stars tend to play themselves. You know, Bogart basically plays Bogart. Marilyn Monroe basically plays Marilyn Monroe. And that's what we want from stars. We actually don't want stars to, to show us a wide range. We, we like them because of the certain persona they carry. If you're a fan of W.C. Fields, you want to see W.C. Fields kind of play W.C. Fields. But what someone figured out here, I think it was the producer, David Selznick, was Fields is kind of Dickensian. And there's a character in, in David Copperfield, Mr. Micawber, who is kind of, kind of Fieldsian. So what you try at times is, uh, with someone like Alec Guinness, what you're looking at is an actor who really kind of changes himself to get into those characters. What you're looking at with stars like this is you want Fields to be kind of the comedian you expect, but you weave him into this story where the character has some qualities like him. But I did think it would be nice in this series to see one of the Hollywood um, adaptations. Um, some of you may remember, equally a star at the time, not remembered much anymore, is Freddie Bartholomew, who was a very popular child star um, who's chosen for the character of David. Um, Great Expectations, directed by David Lean right after World War II, is as this, um, uh, this is a poster for this recent uh, restoration of the film. Uh, as, as uh, the British Film Institute has now decided is the greatest Dickens film ever made. Um, many people think so. Many people think this is a high point in Dickens adaptations. Again, um, David Lean, who will go on to a very prominent, successful career, this is the director of later um, Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Zhivago. Um, he makes this film and shortly after it, he does his version of Oliver Twist. Um, and these are seen as, on the one hand, very, um, very faithful, uh, very skillful adaptations of Dickens, but they're also very much of their time. Um, even though they're representing the Victorian period, they are recognized to be very much post-World War II British films. They're very dark. They're very moody. And I mean literally dark. Um, they have the look of, of film noir if you're familiar with that category. Um, heavy shadows. Um, and this film has, um, I won't spoil it, but if you know the novel, it has at least two harrowing scenes. Uh, the opening and then um, a later scene, which um, disturbed people. I meant to say about the earlier films, those short little films, it's often baffling to people. What, make, what sense could anyone make of a, a one minute adaptation of, of Bleak House or a three minute, um, uh, Christmas Carol. The common understanding of those films is at the time, the audience was presumed to know those texts already. You weren't going to be introduced to a story or characters that were new to you. The way we go into a film now, we think, oh, I don't know what to expect and everything needs to be introduced for me. It would be kind of like the way we go to a Shakespeare play. I don't go to, a, I don't go to see Hamlet not knowing how it ends. I know how it ends. Um, but I still want to see it again, and I want to see another version of it, and I want to see how this person handles it, and I want to see how this theater troupe approaches it. And the understanding is that, um, that people in those earlier films already knew, you know, what happens in A Christmas Carol, and, and while some audiences might be new to it, on the whole, there's the pleasure of repetition. There's the pleasure in coming back to something that you already know and seeing variations on it, seeing how, again, someone new approaches it, but approaches something familiar to you, something known to you. 
Um, at the same time, this film seems to have been adjusted for an audience that maybe didn't know the novel, because it does have scenes that uh, were described at the time as shocking people, making people jump. Um, and, and there was even concern that this film might be difficult for children to watch because of the disturbing content to it. I hope I'm being more, more teasing about that than, than, than you know, annoying and not telling you what exactly I'm referring to, but I want you to see the film and I, and I think you'll see immediately what I'm talking about. Um, well, one of the things I'm talking about is the opening scene for those of you who know the novel. Um, and then I thought it was, uh, would be important for at least one film in the series to be what I guess I'll call, without, um, without negative connotation, an unfaithful adaptation. Many adaptations of Dickens, as you all know, many adaptations of, of all sorts of texts, are not faithful. Um, they are not particularly concerned with uh, moving from one medium to another and, and getting everything exactly right. Um, now this film, Oliver, is in fact pretty faithful to the original text of Oliver Twist, but of course it's a musical. And so even shifting it in genre that way, uh, saying, well, let's tell this story, but let's do something that you know, typically is not done with Dickens. Let's make sure it's full of songs and musical performances um, was significant enough that the, the title was even changed. So it's not Oliver Twist, it's Oliver separate. And I, I noticed something curious. I'd read this somewhere, but I noticed about this um, ad. Um, Dickens' name doesn't appear on this. Um, so this is, this is the man who wrote this musical. This is Lionel Bart's Oliver, not, and even down where it says written by, and there's nothing from the novel by Charles Dickens. I think it was taken for granted that everyone knew that, but it's curious that that doesn't appear here. But I think it's one indication that this is a whole new thing. I thought I would mention, if any of you saw the recent news, um, that uh, the actor, singer, musician, uh, Davy Jones of the Monkees, the musical group, the Monkees, passed away recently. He actually, first became well known, he's not in this film, this was adapted from a stage musical, he played the Artful Dodger as a little boy um, in the original London stage production of this, it's a different actor who plays this. Um, this is for my money, um, of all the adaptations of Oliver Twist, and again there are many, 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 um, this is the best Bill Sykes. Um, Bill Sykes is always played by some terrifying, menacing actor, but uh, Oliver Reed in this case seems to me the most effective. He's, I saw this as a kid and he terrified me, so maybe it's just my response as a child. Um, and as I said, unfaithful adaptations, there are lots of them, and probably Christmas Carol has had more of them than any other Dickens story. Um, and you saw in the clip, there's a Muppets version, I, I mentioned my childhood favorite, there's the Mr. Magoo version, there's this recent updated version with Bill Murray. Um, but one of the things that Dickens' texts seem to suggest is if you're not going to try to, as it were, get it right and be faithful to the original, there's a lot of flexibility there. There's a kind of core story that you can, you can play with in interesting ways. And I thought I'd give you two more that maybe are less familiar. Um, Boy Called Twist is a South African adaptation of Oliver Twist. So if not in Victorian London, what would this story look like in contemporary Cape Town is the, the sort of premise this filmmaker works with. Um, this other film, Twist, um, is uh, a, a Canadian film and it is set entirely in a um, uh, gay underworld of London. What if something, you know, no one dared suggest of the earlier version of Oliver Twist. What if this all-male society uh, centered around Fagan was an erotic society that this film explores? And the last film in the series, Nicholas Nickleby, is the most recent film. It's, it's a, a relatively short film, normal length film, of a very long book. And I mentioned before there's a theatrical version that was extremely long. Um, but it, uh, it strikes me as a good way to end this series, a dozen other films might have been as well, but because this film very nicely, uh, this is Dickens' novel that is most specifically about uh, the world of theater. And it goes back 
in, in clever ways, particularly if you've seen the film, the credit sequence. It has this lovely little credit sequence that is a kind of tribute to Victorian theater. Um, so again, I haven't, I've said almost nothing about Dickens' relation to the theater, which is a long and complicated one, as long as compli and as complicated as the, the one to film, and one in which Dickens himself participated, um, unlike film. But uh, this, even though this is a very recent film and it has a kind of recent sensibility in certain ways, um, this is uh, one of the, uh, this main comic couple in the film, played by the actor Nathan Lane on the left, and his wife is played by um, the actor Barry Humphreys, who you may know better as Dame Edna Everidge, um, the Australian star. Um, and so this is a film playing in some ways with contemporary sensibilities and contemporary sense of comedy, but if you see the film, I do think it harkens back to um, Victorian theater. And I'll end with uh, this clip. I just sort of unapologetically slipped in my favorite line um, in Dickens. This is from the very first page of Great Expectations, uh, where Pip is uh, in the graveyard um, before the grave stones of his parents. And, and in his narration, he says, as I never saw my father or my mother and never saw any likeness of either of them, for their days were long before the days of photographs, my first fancies repeat regarding what they were like were unreasonably derived from their tombstones. The line here that's always intrigued me, it's a fascinating opening in all kinds of ways, but the line that's always intrigued me is the little parenthetical comment, their days were long before the days of photographs. Now Dickens does something very clever just in uh, this, this text that's first published in 1860. He knows that when his initial readers are reading this, they are now in the days of photographs. And again, he's been photographed. Um, so they're asked to imagine a time, first it's sort of unimaginable for us now to imagine a time when there were people who were never photographed, the time when no one was photographed. Um, and he registers in that little line that that's changed. Now people are photographed. Now uh, a boy might have pictures of his dead parents in a way Pip does not. Um, and I'm, I'm pushing a little, I'm extrapolating and saying, I like to imagine how Dickens might ponder the days of cinema or the days of television or even the days of the internet. Uh, now that we're in those days or maybe we're even at the tail end of some of those days. Um, but uh, uh, he, he could imagine in his lifetime the change between time before photographs and the time after photographs. He didn't live long enough to, to think about the time before and after cinema, but he's been this continual presence in that, that history ever since. So I'll stop there. I'd be glad to take questions. They've asked if you do have questions, because this is being recorded, if you would speak in this microphone. Any comments or questions, I'd be happy to take. And I'm going to cheat a little. Um, Professor Teresa Mangum is here, who is a Victorian literature specialist, unlike me. So if there are real um, Victorian lit or Dickens questions, she can take them, and I can handle the film questions. And I, they do want you to use the microphone, please. Now, is he supposed to have said or uh, written that for these days were long before the days of, of photography? Well, this is his character, Pip. But yes, Pip is, um, you know, I don't provide the full quotation, but it's an astonishing passage. He's looking at the gravestones of his parents. He's a young boy, and he's trying to remember or imagine what they look like based on those because he doesn't have a photo. Right. Because okay. they lived before photos. Right, but so, did, so he was projecting ahead that photos were coming? Well, <laughs> when this book appears, for us, oh, for Dickens oh. and for us, now we are in the days of photographs. Okay. But to me, it's, um, it's, it's registering that the experience for me is with my students, 
when I have to say the days before the computer and they go, there were such days? <laughs> there was a time? Or I say, and this is true for me, I used to study film um, before we had video, before, we, before I could rent a film and watch it at home. And they say, how did you do that? And I explain there were these things called projectors and reels of film. But so I, I like that he's picking up on this, this you know, momentous change in how representation has worked, how the representation of humans has worked. Um, and I'm, I'm projecting, to, to use a bad pun, into the next phase with, with film. Then. So he, he didn't live to know hundreds and hundreds of films would be made of his novels, and I'm wondering how he might have approached that. Is my recollection correct that his novels were written in serials, yep. one after the other, and, and no editing, go back to edit it? Once it was written, it was done, and he wrote the next one, and he wrote the next one? Well, this is, again, where Teresa could answer that better than me, but yes, I mean, they're written serially, and even more amazingly, he's, he's working on multiple novels at the same time. <laughs> he's finishing one while he's starting another things like that, and um, I, there is revision that's going on, but no, after something, um, you know, appears in print, he really can't go back and, and fix that. Um, but my understanding is he elaborately mapped these things out, and maybe changes were made for the publication in the novel, I don't know, were they? Yes, I guess so. Okay, thank you. Uh, just that point, I made it too quickly, the point about serialization does suggest that the best way to do Dickens might be some version of that. And so the fact that uh, when you think of a you know, Masterpiece Theater version or BBC version that they do it serially, um, that still doesn't feel to us like a film. It feels like something in parts. But that's closer, actually, to a Dickens novel in some sense. The thing that I don't think anyone has ever done is something that matched a Dickens novel. So. If there's a BBC, I, I don't have the numbers before me, but I think you know if they do a version of Bleak House, they may do six or eight episodes. The book must have you know five times that chapters. So I don't know that anyone's ever done a chapter by chapter where you might have 40, 50 episodes, something like that. So inevitably, things get removed, things get cut. Well, I'm trying to wrap my head around that first quote about um, when, when he would, was doing things in serial form and people would pick up his story and finish it before he had a chance right, to. Right. So did they, and, and it said that they used their own names, yeah. but did people, I mean, were they as popular? I mean, his serials were so popular. Did people know that this was a Dickens serial that was being treated that way or? Oh, I assume they did, and, and, and my guess is some were popular and some were not. Um, but uh, the people who are picking this up are, are, are I'm trying to think of a nice word, but it's... Um, well, they're pirates. <laughs> they're pirates, but they're, they're taking advantage of the popularity. So, right, right. So the fact that everybody is caught up in the latest not, you know, story by Mr. Dickens is what they're, they're relying on. So you're reading this and you're in the middle of it and here it is at the theater down the street. But then they also, their people are saying, but we're waiting for the real thing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And some of you may know the famous stories of, um, these are being published simultaneously in New York, or in the US, and um, uh, the famous stories of uh, you know, New Yorkers going down to the docks waiting for the boat to arrive because they, they want to get the latest issue. You know, they want to be the first to read it. Um, this, most famously, when there's a, there's a threat, he's going to kill one of his major characters, and, and everybody's kind of waiting with bated breath to get the latest issue. Any more questions? Anyone else? Well, I will say thank you, and, and do take advantage of the film series. I think you'll enjoy all of them. And I didn't know about the, the planned um, Christmas Carol Marathon, so that even sounds more enticing. Well, and one last thing is, thank you for, I think, a wonderful foundation for the, the film series, but we do also have the, the written word here, and so you could borrow the book and read beforehand, too. So if you don't have a list of the films, 
we have it for you. And I, again, I'd like to thank Professor Creekmore and Teresa, who have done a wonderful job in bringing Dickens to us at the Iowa City Public Library. So thank you very much.